Are you feeling stuck, lost, tired, or uninspired? We've all been there, including myself. I'm Coach Des, mindset motivator and lifestyle entrepreneur. I'm here to tell you that the best, unapologetic, and limitless version of yourself is yet to come. The Born Unbreakable podcast is here to inspire just that. With motivating guests from all different walks of life and around the world, their stories will empower you to unlock abundance and your unbreakable spirit. Do you need accountability? Reach out to me for a free consultation of how I can support you in reaching your maximum potential. This episode is brought to you by Sherpa Way Marketing. Are you a business looking to gain greater visibility online through search engine optimized content? Maybe you need effective ad campaigns to kickstart or bolster traffic to your website. Sherpa Way Marketing has seasoned experts that are bilingual in English and Spanish. Let them take the guesswork away and enhance your brand positioning with their comprehensive marketing services. Go to SherpaWayMarketing.com. That's S. S H E R P A W A Y marketing.com to schedule your free 45 minute consultation today. Welcome to the Born Unbreakable podcast. I'm your host, Coach Des, and I'm so excited for my guest today who's calling in early in the morning for her because she's actually in Melbourne, Australia which is a day ahead. And I learned that we are in different seasons. So it is actually winter over there and it is summer here in America. So we get to celebrate a lot of different things, time zone differences, seasonal differences. This is the the diversity that we're experiencing, which is awesome. But today I have with me Fiona DeMarc and she is an inspirational speaker a resilience coach, and she has background in social work and therapy. So amazing experience to be able to help other people break through their blocks to achieve inner peace and fulfillment, which, oh my goodness, do we all just want to experience more of that in our lives. Um, Fiona actually has a unique experience related to resilience because she was born legally blind, So that disability has, you know, brought on some different unique challenges, maybe compared to the kinds of challenges that you've experienced. So she'll talk a little bit about that, but um, she certainly knows a thing or two about turning, you know, lemons into lemonade, as she might say. So Fiona, thank you so much for dialing in so early in your part of the world. Thank you for having me. This is, this is just remarkable. You know, this, this topic of resilience, overcoming adversity, uh, you know, and also just this channeling our energy, which is such a, it it seems like it's a simple thing to do to channel our energy in the direction of positive, but there seems to be so many forces that want to disrupt that flow and push us in negative directions. So (laughs) we're grateful for having people that do work like you, but I'd love to start Fiona with your story because when I learned about you, I know that um, you experienced a number of forks in the road. And I know in watching your story at 16 is when you were grappling with with some different things. So I'd love for you to share the kinds of things that you've had to overcome and we can just get into a natural conversation. Lovely. So I guess it all started way back, way way back when, not quite when the dinosaurs were working around, but (laughs) sometimes it feels like it. (laughs) Um, I grew grew up in um, a little place that is um, quite remote in Australia. So if you imagine the the red dirt and the kangaroos and, you know, the snakes in the bushes, that's that's pretty much where I was growing up. Um, So very outback and very resource poor. Our closest capital city to where I grew up was about five and a half hours away. And so I guess that, that really shaped how I grew up a lot, um, very kind of just I think my parents were very resilient and they they taught us 
um, I've got I've got a couple of sisters and they taught us to be very resilient as well. And so growing up, you just kind of worked out an alternative to get around things that weren't working very well. And I think, you know, I had cousins and a nephew and whoever else that was sort of, you know, running around with me as a child. And my disability didn't really tend to impact me so much when I was younger. It has deteriorated a lot across the years. And so as a child, it was impactful, but not, um, you know, not to the point where it was sort of, you know, a huge influence on my life. But as I got older and my vision deteriorated, it became more of an issue. And I think the biggest time of life where it became the biggest issue was as a teenager because you're trying to carve out your place in the world at that point in time anyway. We we all sort of, you know, go through a bit of an identity crisis, I think, in those t- teenage years working out where it is that you want to go with life. And for me, it was a case of, well, I'm not really sure and what does this look like with a disability and what are the things that I can potentially do and what, you know, they're they're there has to be a level of realism to say, well, there's some things I can't do. Like I'm certainly not going to go and be an airline pilot or something. <laughs> Just, that's not, not, not a great idea, yeah. So there has to be a reality check somewhere. And within that, I guess for me, I had some added sort of, you know, challenges in that, you know, there weren't a lot of resources in terms of getting support from outside places. I wasn't getting a lot of support from anyone really when I think about it and um you know one of the the additional challenges was that my dad passed away unexpectedly when I was about 15 and I had to deal with all of the sort of you know the stuff that comes with that and I think just some you know school bullying and and you know I thought I think it was just one of those things that I just kind of got to the point where really I was probably you know needing to be um, assessed as, as, you know, potentially having depression. But, you know, due to the location and the time and whatever else, it was just pull your socks up, get on with it, you'll be right. And that support really just was was not there. In fact, I actually had people, you know, in, in my immediate family telling me, I, you know, we don't understand why you're pushing yourself and trying to work all of this out because you're not going to get anywhere in life. You're not going to achieve anything. It was that expectation of having a disability meant that you you weren't ever going to be successful at anything other than sort of, you know, maybe maybe working in a place where you were, you know, in a factory or something. And I'm just like, no, that's just not me. That's not where I want to be at. But I don't know what it is that I want to be doing. And I think I really got to the point where it was that fork in the road of make the decision to go out on my own and be independent and kind of just push and look, I'm probably quite a stubborn person. And so to push past what everybody else was telling me and to just go, you know what, like I'm just going to do my own thing and see how this turns out. And I, I really focused on that. And within that, I realized that my story could potentially help others. And so there was a point where I was, you know, I guess suicidal is probably the only way to be explaining it. And I realised that if I felt that miserable at that point in time, that potentially there were other people that were doing it hard and tough and going through similar experiences and their own challenges that were potentially making them feel that way as well. And so I took the opportunity to do a presentation at school on suicide and how we could all look out for each other and do those little things that were potentially going to help somebody through that situation. And at that moment, I think it was just, okay, well, I can do this. I can help other people. I can share my story. And it wasn't until fairly recently, actually, that I look back and I go, wow, that was actually a huge thing at 16 to realise that that was the path of the rest of my life. And, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but looking back, that was the moment where I decided I was going to use my skills to help other people. And that's what I've continued to do. Oh, my goodness. It's amazing to be able to look back and say that happened Mm -hmm. and you've continued to manifest that forward. Yeah. And I, I think a lot of times at a young age, 
we naturally gravitate to things that we're good at, but we're not at that maturity level where we can name, name it, right? To predict what form that's going to take shape in, whether it is counseling or coaching or therapy or um, could because what you feel is I want to help people. What that looks like could be such a multitude of things. It's, it's like hard to put your finger on it, but through and, time. And, you know, I look back and I think, you know, had I not had those experiences of grief and, um, you know, not having the support and, and all of those other things that sort of went hand in hand at that period of time, had I not had that experience, had I been the, you know, the popular kid at school that, you know, had all the support mechanisms in, in place and family life was perfect and whatever else, I would have never ended up with the situation that I do now. And so looking back on it, and this is what we can do with many of the challenges that we face in life, when you look back in retrospect, as terrible as that situation may have been, there is always that silver lining in the cloud. There's always something that you can pull from that experience and go, well, you know what, that was pretty terrible at the time, but if I'd not experienced that, I wouldn't have experienced this. And you can bring something else out of it. And sometimes that's realizing that you do have that inner strength. Yes. And that silver lining is, it is real. And I, it, it creates perspective. Mm. That's how our perspective, you know, is formed. I do want to come back to your disability and what it was like to manage through that, just given the fact you said it, it wasn't a resource rich uh, experience that you had growing up. So what are some of the things that you had to do to get support specifically with your disability and how, and how you could work past the limitations that people were essentially placing on you by mm -hmm. saying, well, you can't do this. How do you get to a place where you start telling yourself you can? It took a long time and it wasn't until gosh, I was probably in my mid-20s before I really started to advocate for myself and to realise that having a disability wasn't a bad thing. It was part of who I was and it was something that I could potentially embrace. And, mm -hmm. you know, instead of feeling that I had to fit with everybody else's expectations to actually start building my own. And, look, there were definitely supportive people. Like, I mean, I look at the education system, for example, and, you know, look, I love school. I was one of those those nerdy little kids that was quite happy to sit in the library. And um, but I look back and think, you know, there were times where I definitely did have some support, but there were times where I didn't. And it wasn't necessarily because people were being specifically unsupportive. It was maybe just because they didn't know. And when you don't know, you don't know, yeah? And so mm -hmm. I remember... Um, you know, one of the things that I look back on is, and so, so, someone said to me the other day, actually, they were talking about, um, you know, the little cartoon characters, um, like Snoopy and, and, and Peanuts or whatever. And yeah. said, oh, look, there's, there's someone wearing a, a, you know, a Snoopy shirt. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like it just brought back this memory of writing lines. And they had this, um, I don't know, it was like a, 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 human development kind of little little textbook thing and they had like the little pictures of Snoopy. Snoopy was the person that was teaching you all of these things about, um, you know, biology and whatever else and that was the book that they got us to write lines from in PE class when you didn't turn up with your, your correct uniform or whatever. And, of course, you could imagine with a disability, PE class was just a nightmare for me. It wasn't that I didn't like sport. It was just that it was never adapted to something that I could do. So, of course, you know, I'm not able to go out there and play cricket or basketball or hockey or whatever it was that there was a standard thing that the, the school had chosen as part of the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying, oh, okay, well, let's make this somehow inclusive and accessible, oh, well, if you can't do it, you have to sit over with the kids and write the lines. And so <laughs> now I look at Snoopy and go, oh, my gosh, that reminds me of writing those lines and, and essentially being punished for something that was totally out of my control. 
And I, I, it took me a long time. It's only within the last few years that I've actually managed to change my mindset on sport and go, you know what, I can be a sports person. I can participate in physical activities. I just need to think about how to do that differently and to have the support mechanisms in place to allow me to do those things that I want to do. But mm -hmm. Yeah, like back back in back in the school days, it was very much a case of um, you know just kind of work it out as you go. And quite often, I was felt I was look either I I wouldn't say I was made to feel because that's kind of not taking responsibility of my own stuff. I would probably say that you know I did quite often feel that I was inadequate or that you know because the systems weren't in place it made me feel as though I couldn't contribute in the same way as everybody else. And I took that quite personally and didn't realise that having a disability was about making things accessible rather than feeling like I didn't fit in. Yeah. And I think one of the things that what you're describing is making me think of is advocacy and mm -hmm. how when there isn't what you need to thrive because the resources aren't available or people just haven't spent enough time thinking through something, you almost have to make a decision as to whether the status quo is what will be accepted mm -hmm. or if you take a path of advocacy to change the status quo, to advance where things are. Uh, and I think even when we fast forward to today, there's, there's quite a bit more that is thought about for those with disabilities, but still not, not everything. There's always going to be things that, you know, people are embarking on for the first time because that's just the way of the world. There's new, there's new situations, there's new companies mm -hmm. that face these decisions and they need people to help them determine what that path forward should look like. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even simple things like, you know, designing websites so they're accessible. Like, I mean, it's, it's something that's very straightforward and quite easy to do, but people just don't have once again, don't have that mindset of, oh, okay, well, we've just done this. Should we make sure that it's accessible for everybody? They just kind of go, oh, okay, well, we've designed this thing and we assume that it's going to be okay. And, mm. yeah, to I really love actually being able to change people's thought patterns at that, that bottom level. It's rather than going, oh, okay, well, we need to implement all of these strategies and policies and, and legislation. I think to just get people to think differently in the beginning is, is a huge thing to go with because it's like, well, now I know that I need to think about that then I'll add that to part of my processes. But if I don't know that I should be even thinking about it because it's something that I've never been um, involved with before or something that's that's never come across my my thought process, then I don't know about what I should be thinking in terms of how to make things accessible and inclusive. Right. One of the things that I've focused on a lot more heavily this year is working with organizations in the hospital setting on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating work because to the earlier point that you made, people don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. Your circle is only as big as what you've been exposed to. Mm -hmm. So you, the ability for us to expand that circle only comes when we ask different questions, we become curious, and we create an environment where we can thrive by learning. It, you know, it's, it's almost like a, uh, making a commitment that learning is a value that we want to prioritize so that we can advance how we think about diversity beyond just the common part of diversity, which is the color of our skin or the ethnic background that we come mm -hmm. from, but um, down to the way that 
that we function, the way that we, you know, create things. So people, if they're is a disability with uh, sight or hearing or mobility that those kinds of things are addressed. And most times it isn't malintent that people have. It's just lack of awareness and lack of knowledge. Mm, So we have to, you know. And people I find once they do think differently are really welcome and and encompassing and keen to say oh okay well how can I do this differently and better but it's it's making that on their agenda and unless they've had that individual experience they don't know to put it there Mm -hmm. you know I know in the work that you do helping people get past their blocks you know energy blocks self-limiting beliefs. I was, I'm really curious because I know you've done this work and I've, I, it's one of those, these things where I'm like, is this a trend because you see so much more of it, but the, some of the healing components of what you do is in the space of like holistic thinking and Reiki, you know, for example, um, I've started to hear Reiki used more. Can you talk about exactly what that is and how you use it um, with maybe some of your clients to help open them up to more in their life? Mm -hmm. So Reiki has been around for quite a long time and I think you're right, it is becoming much more mainstream. It's not quite so woo-woo as it used to be. Um, I learnt gosh, probably more than 20 years ago now and am up to master level, which means that I can teach others if I I wish to do so. And so it's just something that I've sort of had in my toolbox for a long time and just kind of comes automatically. So it's energy healing. So um, hands-on kinds of energy healing. And regardless of the way that you think about it in terms of how much you want to think about it transferring universal energy or or you know whatever the basis of it is is that it's it's putting your hands um on somebody in a calming and healing way and so you know we all do it you know you you the person that's crying yeah you've got, you see somebody in there they're upset you'll reach out and touch them and so just that human touch sometimes i think has such a healing power and so to be able to do that with the benefit of you know having that backup of reiki it means that you know my children have grown up to be able to you know when they had their little you know the (laughs) boo-boos falling over or whatever you could always just you know give that little bit of reiki and and to to tap into that resource and then now to use it for clients um, if they're open to the concept of, um, you know, the the Reiki treatment and someone just taking that hour of time to really focus on that person and quite often I'll tie it in with other things. So it might be that I do a guided meditation or a hypnosis session or something at the same time. And so to really sort of, you know, give somebody that that dual process of, I guess, you know, a holistic approach of healing. And so it gives them that comfort of touch at the same time where they might be, you know, going into quite an emotional space. And so it works really, really well to go hand in hand with other things as well as being something that you can use completely individually. Wow. Is there a best practice of how that is done? Like is are people normally laying down to be in a certain type of energy? Mm. Can you do it sitting up? Is there does it matter? You can do it anywhere. Um that's that's the best thing about it. I mean, look, if you're thinking about doing a whole treatment where you really want someone to just sort of you know, dissolve into the the whole process of Reiki, then, yeah, generally laying down like on a massage table or whatever, um, you know, is is where I will do the the full treatment. But someone can do it, you know, sitting in, sitting in and, um, you know, just in a chair or standing up or, as I said, it might even be just a five-second kind of, you know, you touch somebody and, and, you know, do that energy transfer you know, it might only be a brief touch. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, that whole big process of, of a treatment for an hour. 
Wow. Yeah. So it's really dependent on individual, what Mm. they're, what they're open to. And, and, uh, I, you know, I think about this space and there's a couple of things that come to mind. One is vulnerability Mm. of just, you know, being honest enough to, to say, this is the energy that I'm in. And I really want to be in a different energy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. I want more peace. I want more calm. Um, my, you know, I think about common things that happen to us, like racing thoughts, uh, anxiety and depression, right? They say um, depression is is tied to often thinking about trauma, things of the past, mm-hmm. or anxiety is often about thinking of too much of the future and mm-hmm. worrying about what's going to happen. Is just how do you get in an energy where you're present and you can just be in the here and the now? Um, so vulnerability is kind of one thing that I think of. Um, <clears throat> and just an openness, you know, because to your earlier point of, of saying, oh, you know, so there's some folks that might say, oh, gosh, this is such a woo-woo thing. Like, you really think somebody sitting there and doing this with you is going to make a huge difference for a few minutes. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't think until I personally had opened myself up because of things like trauma that that's almost what pushed me to, to be in a space of like, okay, I really, I I really am admitting to opening up to needing something new is I just, I wonder sometimes if, if that lack of openness is because, um, you know, people might just not be mentally ready for that, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, or something, but I was just thinking about that as you were talking. Yeah. And I mean, that's huge to be able to say, Hey, look, I am in this really vulnerable state and not many people can acknowledge that they sort of come and say there's something not right but I don't quite know what that is and I can't put my finger on it and you know they we're all taught to you know put this brave face on and to show the world everything's all right you know every time someone comes up to you and they how are you today oh yes I'm great Woo! you know it doesn't have to be you know no one ever says oh well to to be honest today I'm pretty rubbish how often do you yeah. get that response? Very, really. very rarely. Even when mm-hmm. things are bad, you just, yep, I'm okay, I'm fine. And right. quite clearly and sometimes you're not. <laughs> but. I do think I do think it's a default position. There's some hmm. some bit of conditioning. Um, whether it is in person and you're doing the kind of dr- what I might call like a drive-by conversation where just to – get past the conversation you're not trying to get into this space of explaining Mm. that you're just really in a crappy space or having a horrible day um and i think in the virtual world we see that manifest in how people share things through social media because it's predominantly the positives Mm. right which is Mm. which is good i mean you're you're talking about the weddings and the baby showers and the graduations and the celebrations, right? Like people are sharing that. Yeah, not, or, or just not, even, not, it's not like, oh, I'm just going to get on here and uh, talk about how I caught every red light. I'm not <laughs> sure what I want to do with my life. My kids are, you know, hate me. Um, I have marital problems i mean people are not going out there and talking no and i mean that that, it's it's interesting because we do we kind of separate that and say this is this is for you know what i want to show to the world and this is what i want to maybe only share with the people that i trust or the people that i'm really close to but then it does put that skewed impression across of of this you know wonderful life to other people and so then if that's what you presented with all the time, it reinforces that, oh, well, everything's all great, but I don't feel great. Oh, well, now I feel like the odd one out because I'm not feeling great. And to sort of, you know, and I think this is, <laughs> this has been, you know, um, maybe a, a big perspective, but thinking about the younger generation, if they're basing their 
mindset on the way that social media portrays things, they don't get to see people that are in that situation where things are tricky and things are difficult. And so when them, them themselves are experiencing those difficulties, it does make it so much harder to say, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm just like everybody else. And somewhere logically you know everybody goes through tough times but when all you're seeing is all the gloss and glitter of, of happiness, mm-hmm. it's really hard to sometimes say, oh, you know what, that's that's not my life, but that's okay. Right. And 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 it really is that second sentence of and that's okay. Mm. You know, is that acceptance that for for every up there there is the possibility for there to be a down and to to the point of what you work in every day is that's resilience Mm -hmm. right it's that it is the ability for us to in those moments of down how we turn things around to be in a in a better state of mind so speaking of resilience one of the things i wanted to ask you fiona was there's the work people do with you when they're with you right? So they're, they're coming to you saying, this is what I want to work on. Mm-hmm. I want to be in a better energy. And you, in that one-on-one time with them, can help them through that. What are ways that you see your clients able to sustain that kind of behavior when they're on their mm-hmm. own? <laughs> like, yeah. how do you do it when you don't have the hand holding mm-hmm. and now you're back in the challenging space of independence and wanting yeah. to still have those same experience, the feelings of resilience on your own? And I think, you know, you really do need to have those tools because we're always going to face those challenging times in life. You know, it's it's inevitable that something is going to come along and depending on the scale of that, it might be small scale, it might be just getting all of the red lights on the way to work and you, now you're late, or it might be something huge like you've, you've lost your job or you've lost a loved one. Regardless of whatever those situations are, we always need to work out, okay, well, how do we get through them? And quite often when we look back, we've learnt something from that experience. But in the moment, it's very difficult to do so. And so it's all about using that toolkit of resources to say, okay, well, look, there's a point where I need to experience this and how long you let yourself do that relates to the scale of the situation but at some point you've got to go okay well you know I don't want to feel like this anymore I've been in that moment now I've experienced the negative situation for whatever it is and we know all need to have those negative situations because if you don't have them you don't ever realize how fantastic the rest of life is you need to have that balance of some really good things and some really bad things and so the rest of life just sort of sits in the middle nicely So it's all about, I guess, working out what individually works for you. And it might be that, okay, well, it's it's reaching out to a support person, a friend that will listen to you and not judge your situation. It might be that you, you know, go and exercise because that's your thing. It's very hard to be unhappy when you're exercising. Um, it might be that you you go and watch your favourite movie, read a favourite book, listen to your favourite music, something to distract you from that current situation. Um, you know, there's, there's numerous things. It could be meditation. It could be um, exercises that will make you mindful in the moment. And there's, there's many of those that are, that are, you know, out there and you just find the ones that work for you. There's, there's many, many things that you can do. You've just kind of got to work out, okay, well, what are my go-tos? And it might be that one time that particular thing works, next time it doesn't, or maybe it's not appropriate. Like if you're having, you know, your your, um, time of need and it's 3 o'clock in the morning, probably not appropriate to be reaching out to your support person and giving them a phone call. Um, You know, that might be okay in some circumstances. Once again, it depends on the scale of things. But, um, yeah, like you've just got to kind of work out what it is that works for you out of that toolkit of things. And that's part of what I do with people is go through those things and say, oh, okay, well, you know, have you thought about this, this, this and this? 
has any of this worked for you in the past? What are the things that you think you can implement in the future that are going to be beneficial to you? Yeah, I think that's awesome. I love the word toolkit because there is an arsenal that we can tap into. And sometimes uh, it's the awareness of moments that trigger us, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of bring us to a certain spot and us figuring out what, what do I need in this moment? Maybe I need more laughter. Maybe I need more reflection. You know, maybe I need someone to listen to me. And so that is sort of your part of your decision making path is based on what you maybe need more of is the 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 path you go down. Because as you were listing all of those things, I was like, yes, I have done that. Mm -hmm. That too. Yeah. That yeah, yesterday I called a friend. And you know, I mean, there's there there are ways that we sometimes don't realize. I think one of the things I've appreciated about working with professionals, like a therapist or a coach, is it's just the acknowledgement of calling things what they are. Hmm. Because when you can name it, you know, your feelings, what you're experiencing, then you're quicker to figure out what do you want to do about it. But sometimes it's interesting how it takes having to engage in conversation with someone else for, for you to have these epiphanies of, mm. oh yeah, huh. And you know, we've got all of those resources. They're all there inside of us and we all know the answers. We may not think we know them, but they're definitely inside. But it just takes sometimes that provoking conversation to bring them to the surface. And quite often, you might have that conversation with somebody else, but they're only going to kind of gloss over the surface and take your first answer as, okay, well, you've answered my question, I'll move on, rather than actually digging deep. And that's the difference in between, I guess, you know, having a conversation with your friend and having a conversation with a coach is I don't like just taking that first answer. I'm going to ask you more and more and more and get you to actually dig down until we get to the real answer that's laying underneath everything that you may not have really thought about. You know it's there and it's dug right into your, your, your subconscious somewhere and until mm -hmm. someone continues to provoke and ask, but what else and what else and what else, suddenly that comes out and then you're like, oh, wow, yeah, okay, yeah, that, that, was, that was the real reason behind whatever was going on. But until yeah. someone digs into those thought patterns, sometimes it's easy to just go with the, the, the surface. The gloss over. You've got to keep peeling mm. back the layers of the onion. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, what, and one sometimes of the that'll make you cry. <laughs> you know, and, and it is. I tell you what, there's so many moments. I think that is one of the most fascinating things about coaching is what you uncover. And mm. that's the, it's the, there's this protective mechanism, right, that we have of ourself. Yeah. And, and so, when we when we put the shield down and the armor and everything and we start to open ourselves up to being more honest with ourselves and others it it changes the way you the way you behave um i was having a conversation with one of the women that i coach recently and i could tell by her affect her demeanor her presence that she was the aura that she was emanating was kind of defeat and and sort of uh, um, not very enthusiastic, you know, mm -hmm. in, in our conversation. And so when I did what you were describing, ask more questions um, and dug a little deeper and what about, you know, what's making you feel this way, um, it came down to the relationship that she was having with her supervisor that was the catalyst for a multitude of things. So once we could identify the root of what was really challenging her, then she could talk about actions aligned with that thing that was really bothering her the most. You know, yeah. it wasn't some of the things that she was mentioning when we first started our conversation. So it took probably 
half of our time <laughs> to get to that place, but you're, you're, you're totally spot on. I think it's, it's natural for us to, um, avoid mm. when <laughs> it's, it, it, it's it's just easier yeah. <laughs> to have to than to have to deal with the situation at hand, right? And so many of our thought patterns are so caught in the past, and you know it's all set up around our values and our belief systems and the things that we were told as we were growing up. And and if you're not really aware of those underlying things that have created you to behave and think the way that you do then sometimes it's very difficult to to get past that surface stuff because you're just like, well, that's the way it is. That's that's the way I've always done it. And to actually go, well, okay, well, why, why are you doing it like that? Then sometimes that's really difficult for people to face. And we often, as a coach, I find people are just so, so stuck in that, that past situation. But, you know, it would, it wouldn't, be like this if it had that that particular event hadn't happened and it's like well you know that event has happened and now you have the opportunity to continue to move forward and whether you let that event have a um an influence on what you're doing now versus just letting it be and saying okay I, I learned something from it and now let it go and move on you know that's really difficult for people sometimes mm-hmm healing is hard mm. Mm. <laughs> you know I, it's it's like we want to put a band-aid on something and just move on yeah um unfortunately but, when you do that though it's like yeah. you know the putting putting all the um you know the skeletons down in in the um in the basement and then eventually you're going to have to go down into that basement to collect something and all of those skeletons are going to jump out at you again and you're back to where you started. Yeah. That's not a fun place to be. No. <laughs> you don't want to go down to a basement full of skeletons. <laughs> nobody, wants, nobody wants that. Um, but, you know, what, what have you learned personally about your resilience and and what it's done you know for you as you faced um, adversity and and how has it helped you to be a better parent and a better coach to others um i definitely learned with pa parenting i learnt what not to do by looking at others and my own situation and went, okay, I need to consciously make a different um, pattern here. And, you know, I would hope that I have done that with my children. They're now 18 and 16, so they're nearly nearly, nearly grown up. Um, not that my job as, as a mum is ever going to be done, <laughs> But, um, yeah, I think, you know, it, it was all about, okay, well, these are the things that didn't work for me, so now I need to, to look at how I can do them differently um, in relation to other people. And I think for me with resilience, look, as I said, we're always going to have those difficult situations. You know, I had a really tricky one a couple of weeks ago and I got news that I didn't like and I had that moment of, oh, my gosh, like, how did that happen? And then, you know, I had a little cry and I'm like, oh, my gosh, what are we going to do? This is horrible. And then I thought, okay, well, you know what, this isn't going to change unless I do something about it. And so I had that moment where I just went, okay, I need to be in this situation. And then I went, I need to now step aside from that emotion and go back to my logical brain and work out how I'm going to to manage this situation and so it's like take action and do something about it and in fact by the, taking the action that I did I totally resolved the problem like it, it's totally gone it's, it went away <laughs> like it, it didn't fix itself I had to ask for somebody else's help to fix it but by stepping out of that emotional state and instead of just letting it happen to me I went you know what I don't like this outcome it needs to be changed. How am I going to do something about it? And I reached out to somebody that I knew could help me get through it. And so, 
it's always going to happen. You're always going to have those moments in life. Mm -hmm. It's about how you deal with them and how quickly you can identify for yourself. I think sometimes I'm going down that rabbit hole and I don't like it. And so now what do I need to do to make this situation different? And the more aware that you can be of being in that situation and and feeling out of control and not liking it and knowing that you need to do something different, I think that's the key, that awareness of I don't want to be doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have that resolve within us. Mm -hmm. I think what what I've experienced (laughs) more lately is I sometimes need to walk away from a situation for a little bit, not, not for a long time, <laughs> enough to get my emotions in check. Mm. I like I to say, a perspective. Because, mm. yeah, because I think in the moment when we're taken off guard, you know, mm. for example, we're taken by surprise, it's natural to, to be in a heightened state of emotion. You weren't expecting something, you know, mm. something just threw you off kilter. And our, our, our first reaction is, is, you know, maybe not the most logical, rational way to approach the problem and that we're often, dealing with. Often we internalize it. Like, what did mm. I do wrong? How come yeah. this has happened to me? And so to once again be able to take that step away and think big picture rather than, and, you know, we we go back to that little negative, you know, devil on our shoulder saying, but you, you know, you're you're not worthy, this has happened because of something that you've done, to be able to step away and go, okay, well, you know, maybe I did create this situation somehow, but now I need to work out how to, how to navigate through that Mm -hmm. yeah you know it wasn't until and i i probably referenced this book way too much but it's just (laughs) because it helped me a lot in my life um the first time i read the four agreements by don Mm -hmm. miguel ruiz and one of one of the four agreements is don't take things personally Mm. um because that would be my, my mo (laughs) <laughs> Any th- yeah. anytime something happened is, you know, a person's behavior or their attitude, I mm. thought was directly correlated with something I specifically did. And it isn't until you learn to process and be a better observer that you recognize people's behavior is in direct correlation to themselves, Mm -hmm. what they're experiencing. It's a projection of themselves, not of you. So you can't, you know, taking things personally can put you in a position to, to expend way more, more, way more emotional energy than is necessary because you're taking responsibility essentially for something that isn't yours. Yeah. Energy wise, you know, so true. Boy, did it take me a long time Mm -hmm. to figure out. (laughs) But but I but that's why I enjoy these conversations and um, talking to other coaches because part of the ability I think to become better teachers, better healers, better helpers is because you're doing the work to learn and grow and continuously heal yourself. Mm. right? Like you're not, you're not exempt from the process that you're helping other people with because you're on the journey just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. Right. So absolutely. Yeah. That's the, it's, you know, we're in this together. Mm. (laughs) I mean, there's, there's so much I think that has happened in the world that has brought us to this place of, um, being more resilient together just gets us further because so much of what we're facing is is ubiquitous. Like mm. this pandemic isn't anybody's favorite thing, you know, to deal with. Um, it's it's worldwide. It isn't just affecting one country or one part of the world. It's something mm. that's affected all of us. And I think we've we've all had to, whether we wanted to or we didn't want to, build a little more resilience <laughs> and yeah. resolve. Yeah, you know. Um, but I, I want to take a a few minutes to ask you a couple of questions for people to get to know you a little better, Fiona. Mm -hmm. And the first 
question I have for you is what makes you unbreakable? Um, I think that faith in myself and maybe it's a little bit of stubbornness, maybe it's, um, you know, my, my resilience, maybe it's resourcefulness, but, you know, being able to take situations and work out an action to them. And I think the times that I struggle most is often when things are out of my control. Somebody else makes a decision and I have to wait for that. Or, you know, time is going to to solve a problem. I don't <laughs> I don't deal with those situations so well. I like the situations where I can take action. And so being unbreakable for me is about being able to take responsibility and take action and continue to move forward and to not focus on the stuff that's not going well and to focus on the stuff that is going well. Yeah. It's a choice. Mm. We, we have a, we can look at it either way, right? We can Mm. focus our attention to, to the positives or the negatives. That is a choice that we make on our own every day. Mm -hmm. What about, Your bucket list. What is something that's on your bucket list that you want to do or accomplish? It's a very funny story, actually. I would have said that I didn't have a bucket list. I'm one of those people that just goes and does stuff when it comes to mind. I'm like, yep, okay, let's go and do that. However, um, something that I am involved in at the moment is, and I'm hoping it comes completely to fruition, is I'm currently a finalist in something that is called the Holman Prize. Holman Prize is set up by the Lighthouse Foundation in San Francisco and it is a worldwide prize that is given out for three um, winners every year to go and do something that is um, challenging yourself and also building awareness around vision impairment. And so you get to sort of, you know, say, I've got this particular project and if you happen to be a winner, you get the prize money to go and spend on that particular project. My particular project, so I'm a finalist, I'm I'm you know, in the top 10 now, so I've got about six weeks to wait until I find out whether I'm actually one of the three lucky winners. But my prize is actually going and doing dares and so those dares may be things from skydiving kite surfing um skiing swimming with sharks all the crazy things that people put on those bucket lists I'm actually going to potentially be doing as part of this prize if I were a winner to be able to say people with a disability can go and do these things just as equally as somebody that is completely able-bodied And so I now do (laughs) kind of have a bucket list because I've got this proposal of all of these items that are are on the on the list of things to do for this prize. That is remarkable. Oh, my gosh. Well, now you're going to have to keep me updated (laughs) about it so I can tell people what's going on. But, you know, I think that's that is going back to what I said earlier about advocacy and awareness right part of part of i think what's exciting about this besides the fact that you're you you're you're potentially going to be able to do cool things is is the teaching that Mm. comes along with it to help people recognize you know the driving force behind it is Mm -hmm. to actually say hey look you know it's about public expectations but it's also about the expectations of the providers of these kind of services because they quite often don't have people that do need different, um, you know, just different thought processes behind it. It doesn't mean that they have to do their activity differently. It's just how potentially can they approach it from a, a different angle. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I love learning about that. That is a really neat thing that they do yeah. to provide that award. So well, if, I, if I'm a winner, I'll have to come back and, and share some of my adventures yeah. with you. <laughs> I know. I really mean that. And I, 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 I hope that you do get that phone call and you're in the, the, the top three winners because that's, um, that just goes a long way, you know. Mm. I mean, talk about building resilience and, oh my gosh, to be able to <laughs> adventure to new things that definitely builds up the, the, uh, the courage and, uh, the, 
the bold action taking when you can uh, do mm. things like jump out of an airplane or swim with sharks. My gosh, <laughs> it's awesome. Um, what about a self-limiting belief? What's a self-limiting belief that you've had to overcome? My hardest one is asking for help. I'm terrible mm. at it because I think I've learnt from, you know, my experiences, especially as a teenager, to just be independent and do my own thing and, and you know, because I didn't have a lot of supports mm -hmm. to now be able to say I need some help with something. And, you know, <laughs> potentially my husband would disagree. He's like, you help ask me for help all the time. But having said that, I mean, even just something simple like, you know, can you get the, the, the plate down off of the top shelf for me because I'm short and he's tall. So it's not just even necessarily something related to my disability. It's because I've learned to be so independent that now like I mean he can be standing in the kitchen and I'll go off and get the footstool to to, to reach to the top shelf and he's like I was standing here I could have done it for you but I'm like oh I didn't even think about it because I just kind of need to do things for myself and so to okay. to make sure that I remember to ask for the help rather than wait until everything's kind of not working and then asking for the help I need to remember that people are people are wanting to help me that's part of you know human relationships as we all want to help each other and so mm -hmm. to remember to ask for that help at a point where you know it's it's perfectly okay to ask for help when things are going okay rather than waiting until things are not okay to ask for it i need to take that advice myself <laughs> i do that's good i'm glad i needed i needed that reminder today because i certainly get into that mode where it's like i got it i'm just doing myself everything all things and mm. and it doesn't have to be that way it's almost yeah. you make your life harder by just putting yourself in a position to to not be asking for help especially when like you said people are people are there and they they want mm. to in the same way that we want to help other people mm -hmm. so that's that that's really good what about something you're really good at like a superpower something that you're proud of superpower i've got heaps of superpowers um oh superpower i think my superpower is definitely got to be my hearing and my ability to multitask different things and so i can be reading a book like via you know like an audio book Yes. kind of doing housework, having a conversation with somebody, paying attention to what happens to be on the television at the same time if the TV's on in the background. Like I can I can multitask different things. Um probably maybe the best explanation of that is how I do my day to day job. So I, I work in a customer service on the phone kind of role and so have a headset on with um my my customer speaking to me through the phone line, have a headset um, that connects to the screen reader that I use for my software. So essentially the way that I use my computer is I have keyboard shortcuts for everything and then a um, like a screen reader that will read out everything on the screen to me. And so I can be doing that. So listening to the customer, listening to the computer as well as listening to the office around me, listening to some music at the same time <laughs> and still wow. being able to concentrate perfectly. So that's my superpower, I think, is being able to have lots of different imports. And, I mean, it's probably absolutely no different to your sense of vision. Like, I mean, I'm sure mm -hmm. you can be looking at several things at one time. Like, I mean, you know, yeah. you can see stuff out of the corner of your eye and you could be doing, you know, it's, it's, my brain isn't using those parts anymore for all of that vision input. So then it's gone, oh, okay, well, we'll, we'll do it a different way. And we'll, we'll give you sort of, you know, various sources of auditory input that you can, you can focus on at one time. Yeah, that's amazing. It's almost a heightened sense mm. of auditory function. Yeah. And I, I mean, it's just like with smell, 
or something if, mm-hmm. you, if you if you know what i mean so there's 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 a lot of different ways that that could go yeah. oh that's awesome yeah i love I'm, that i'm not sure my kids loved my superpower when they were little because i could always hear what they were up to i mean you know people will always say you know mothers have got you know eyes in the back of their head well i think i had you know like bat ears or something <laughs> or <Always, laughs> always hear what they were up to they were like how did you know we were doing that you're at the other end of the house and i'm like oh i can always hear what you're doing you need to learn yeah. how to think better Exactly, right? Oh, man, that is hilarious. Fiona, if there was one last piece of advice that you could give to anyone listening, what would that be? To be kind to themselves, to smile, smile for themselves, smile for other people, and to be kind to yourself. Stop listening to all that negative self-talk that goes on all the time, to be conscious of it, and to actually say, nope, that's not real, and to to replace it with a kind thought because yeah. once you you kind to other people but you're not often kind to yourself and I think to take that time out to look after yourself and be kind to you as well is really important yeah that is really awesome thank you so much for that and thank you so much for your time and your wisdom how can people follow you connect with you reach out to you um Probably the easiest and simplest place is to go to my website, which is www.fionademark.com.au or alternatively, I am all over the socials. So LinkedIn, Instagram, um, the Holman Price stuff I'm going to be posting all over, especially Instagram. Um, So definitely look out for that and you can just search me up by my name. I'm also on Facebook um, as well so yeah just just search my name it's it's quite an uncommon surname so easy to find yeah no that is great and I'll make sure that all of that information is in the show notes so if anyone is tuning in and just click over to the show notes and all the links will be there for you to refer to later I always love that and you don't have to remember too much one stop shop like a little shopping center. Um, But this has been awesome. Thank you so much for the reminders today. I needed so many of them. (laughs) So (laughs) like a little mini coaching session. (laughs) No, really. I mean, I tell you what, sometimes it takes, it takes the repetition, you know, it takes the reinforcement. You know, one of the things that I, that, but one of the many parts of my job besides coaching, executive coaching and, um, is change management. And in order for us to adopt and actually sustain habits, they have to be reinforced. Yeah, You know, it's, you, you don't just do something once and it, it's just becomes autopilot. So, uh, we do need to hear things over and over and over and over. (laughs) (laughs) So yes, I need, I needed that, especially the asking for help part. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you so much for having me. Awesome. What an awesome interview with Fiona DeMarc. And just a bright light, really a bright light. And speaking of bright lights, I'm in bright lights and it is hot. On top of me being in the desert where, of course, it's all, almost officially summer. It feels like summer this moment. Um, It's just going to keep getting hotter in the desert. So over 100 degrees on a daily basis will be life here. That is something to adapt to. I need to build my resiliency around that. That's for sure. Uh, But there's two things that I wanted to call out as takeaways from this episode. One is around resilience. Two is around inclusivity. I want you to ask yourself what you're doing right now to enhance and expand your resiliency. How do you bounce back? What are those things that you do on a day-to-day basis? Fiona talked about the arsenal or the toolbox of things that you can gravitate to when unexpected things disrupt your day, disrupt your flow, disrupt your rhythm. What do you need to do more of so that you can make it through those moments? 
what's worked for you, what might you continue, what might you try differently. Think about your resiliency toolbox. Is it time to reflect? Is it calling a friend? Is it talking to a professional? Is it exercise, meditation? All of that, journaling. I mean, there's not a one size fits all solution, but this is an opportunity for you to explore what works for you and try something different if you haven't landed on that thing that works best for you. The second thing I want to mention is around inclusivity. I'm really happy that Fiona highlighted uh, her disability, that she has. Uh, something that she has had to live with her whole life, which is not being able to see the same way that many of us can and what that has done. Uh, she's had to, you know, do things differently. She described her work uh, process where people talk to her and things are repeated to her. She listens to audiobooks. Um, there's some adaptation that she's done. Now, what can we, what can you, be doing to adapt your environment, be more self-aware, and be more inclusive to those who may have impairments or disabilities. Perhaps it's related to sight, mobility, hearing. There's something that is a little bit of extra that they have to do on their part. What is a little extra that we can do on our part? Have that extra vigilance to ask the questions and not make assumptions of what life is like for those who are unable to do to the full ex fullest extent the things that I, I struggle with the words, <clears throat> to be honest with you, when I hear things like able-bodied because it implies that somebody um, is just, that's why they say disabled. I just the connotation around that, it makes me feel a little uncomfortable. You know, if there was some word that was more around do it differently, uh, that would be more appealing. But anyhow, point being, let's increase our vigilant, our vigilance and do a better job of asking questions and being thoughtful to the people around us. Uh, what, what, what might that look like for you, the spaces that you're in? whether it's work or in your personal life, let's all make that commitment together to be more inclusive. And if you don't understand something, uh, make it a point to, to learn. I appreciate you being here today. Episode 95, we are chugging along here on the Born and Breakable podcast. Reach out if there is a topic you want to hear about or a person or if you are that person that wants to come on the show share your story talk about your unbreakable spirit you can dm me at born unbreakable or email des at bornunbreakable.com remember to follow subscribe share all of that good stuff and rate and review if you haven't already thank you to ava media productions for making this show possible. <laughs> Teamwork makes the dream work, folks. Tune in again next time for another episode. Can't wait to see ya. Or be with ya. Whichever, whichever one. Your sights or your ears. However you tune in.